Can you hear me fine? I can hear you. Over and out, Roger. What's up, right, Roger? Victor? Over and out. Oh, it's like we're in uh, fighter pilots because Tom Cruise and the new Top Gun. movie. Did you love Top Gun? Top Gun was very, very good. The the camaraderie of the gentleman I always found um, endearing. I appreciate a good bromance and a good kind of like team environment thing. Days of Thunder, Top Gun, all those movies. Very Top good. Gun is way better than Days of Thunder. I kind of like them both. You went on a trip since the last time we recorded one of these. España. It felt like Little Miami or Bigger Miami. Got it. No, that's very cultured of you. Why don't you you go ahead and just from here until the end of our introduction, why don't you just speak Spanish to us? Go. S-O-C-K-S. That is what it is. Okay. Yeah, you can go back to English. I I ordered all my food in Spanish. We got to do that. I I, I, want to go back so bad. We got to figure out when. Uh, food, How about food, talk food, your chart, drink. talk your chart on the road. Oh man, take it to Spain. Talk your chart, Spain. That's it. We can I find think that. I've gotten the- enough buzz that it's worth sending us on a month trip to Spain just to record a couple of these. Well, I think we need to find out what the economy is like over there. Talk to the people on the ground, right? Boots on the ground. Okay, let's round this out by coming back to where we started. Your top three Tom Cruise movies. Um, Mission Impossible, one, two, three. Yeah, I know. And so that, that can be one, the franchise. I don't uh, think we can give our viewers much in the way of uh, talking about movies together because the things that I've seen are from 30 years ago. Okay. So we're not going to go with your favorite Tom Cruise movies, but we did our best. <laughs> we did our best. <laughs> Welcome to Talk Your Chart, episode 17 with Marco Segrera and Brett Horowitz. Brett, how are you? Good, Marcos. A long time we haven't done this. I'm sorry I was traveling, but I'm back now. So let's kick off another fantastic episode. Happy to have you back. Today, I want to talk about an animal that lives in the forest. It's a bear because Ooh. I know, I know, I know. A lot has happened since you've been gone. I don't think the index technically hit its bear um, metric, which is a 20% drawdown from the top because. We haven't closed. The market hasn't closed at 20% below, but we've hit intraday lows. So I'm calling it a bear. I think most people are calling it a bear. I think it definitely feels like a bear market, especially with bonds down double digits, worst bond market since 1843. So anyways, obviously we're, we're having a lot of conversations as I'm sure you are with clients about this. So what are we doing? We're trying to frame it all. And I've kind of, I've been using a, how long does it usually take to recover from a bear market? And you can see all the stats. I and think a bear one... market is defined as a 20% drop, right? Yes. Peak to trough. We have those often. I how mean, often? The market... Do you know how often? Well, the market averages about a 14% decline every year. And my guess is we would have a bear market every four years, five years, three years. 3.6, right? 3.6. So did you see the chart? Look at the chart I'm looking at, right? The bear market recoveries one. You see that? Yep. Here's what stood out to me in these last, let's, let's look at the last three and then we'll jump to like the fourth and the fifth, starting from the bottom. So COVID and then 2018 and all that. So the pain was obviously there from as low as 19 down to as terrible as 56% down in the great financial crisis. But look at the last three, how quickly the recovery was, how quick they recovered. Four months, four months, and five months. Is that just the Federal Reserve being a backstop? It's a lot of it, right? I mean, that's the one thing that everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people talk about that this is different because you're not going to get an infusion of money from the Fed. You're not going to get stimulus. You're not going to get lower rates. You're not going to get anything to pump the economy back going back up again. Um, So that's a very big variable that's different this time. Yeah, I think it has to be, right? I mean, it's telling that it goes from a four-month recovery to jump before that 49 months, 56 months. That's a lot of required patience. I've been telling people when I kind of open up meetings, if you weren't a long-term investor in January, you are now. Again, a little bit of a joke, but something that you have to be prepared for is recovery. But if you also look after that 56 months, there still were periods, even looking back to 1956, where the length of recovery 
wasn't multi-year, right? There were still some things that were reasonable. I think another factor is speed with which information moves. And I think the, the speed with which everyone is getting their information and is able to respond to said information is going to make market movements faster. Maybe we get a more precipitous decline and some recovery. I do think for sure, yeah, absolutely. We're not going to get the V-shaped recovery that we got from COVID because there's no backstop, right? The Fed's doing the opposite of that. But speed of information, maybe that makes a difference. Yeah, but I think the other thing would be, I read an article saying that you really need two factors in order to, in order to get a bottom of market. You need to get capitulation, which is everyone saying, this is it, it's done. I don't want to invest in stocks anymore. I don't want to be as high as I was before because in the last few years, right, the Tina effect, there is no alternative. Everyone's in stocks. You know, that's gone away a little bit, but still people are pretty excited about stocks. And two would be just sort of a clearing up of all of this fog around us, all this pea soup that's around us, right? Because you've got so many things that are negative that, just are not going to go away in the near term. You're not going to suddenly have lower rates. You're not going to have the situation in Ukraine resolve itself. COVID is not going to resolve itself right away. Like these things are longer term. But wait, wait, two things. Number one, you said pea soup. Nice. Number two, are you asking for the dust to settle? That's why markets rebound, right? If you're buying in the stock market. But the dust never settles. There's, oh, as soon as inflation's done, it's going to be back to China. And if it's not China, it's going to be something else. Sure, of course. But these are these are larger events than before. I mean, you look at what happened in 20, 2018, and that was one singular event, sort of a trade war with China, and a little bit of fear of rising rates. But that resolved itself pretty quickly. Yeah, um, I hear COVID, you. COVID, you know, the stimulus and all that, that resolved itself pretty quickly. COVID didn't go away, but you just saw that, hey, things were not going no. to be so bad forever. Yeah, the COVID is going to be a non-zero event for a very, very, very long period of time, in my opinion. I agree. Yes, there's always stuff to worry about. But right now, there's a lot of things to worry about. And then we also deal with a thing that really a t- most investors haven't had to ever dealt, dealt with, like inflation like this. You probably weren't alive. You probably just read about this, right? You didn't experience it. Um, and there is something to say about the 1970s if it happens again. And this, uh, this will kind of work me into my, my point of why I wanted to bring up that chart. We looked at it yesterday. Real returns for stock, bonds, and cash was negative in the 1970s, right? Inflation did run hotter. Rates did jump more, but we did have negative real rates of return. So go ahead. You would hope that the Fed has learned its lesson from that time. I mean, the Fed is constantly learning and tweaking and changing its strategy. I can't imagine they would simply fall into the same issue they felt they did last time where inflation ends up being 18% and they got to raise rates, you know, 25 times to get to catch up. Uh, no. And again, I think that also speaks to the speed of information point. Look how quickly bond markets priced in rate hikes without the Fed doing anything. Well, that's because the Fed also telegraphed everything they were doing. Yeah, well, they right. usually do, but in this in this world, they telegraph it, it hits Twitter, and boom, markets are responding. The 10-year ballooned. Look at mortgage rates. Literally year over year, like a 50 per, over 50% increase. Housing, housing is no longer affordable, but we're digressing a little far here. So back to point, which is the fear of, yes, markets recover. Yes, probabilistically, the market is positive. You have a good outcome. of the time over a three-year period, and that number jumps to over 90% over rolling 10-year periods. But what about the last decade? And I've gotten this, right? So the last decade, which is the next chart I'm looking at here, the S&P annualized negative year over year. Negative 0.9%. Right? How does that happen? What do you mean? Wait, the S&P 500 over a 10-year period lost money. And the other one that I have there is the NASDAQ. Well, what happened? What were the bookends to that? Tech bubble, great financial crisis. Okay, how do you avoid that? Here's what I'm going to tell you. The S&P 500 is one asset class. You agree with me, Brett Horowitz? Mm-hmm. What, what asset class is it? U.S. stocks, large cap mainly. Boom, exactly. Let me tell you over that same period of time what the other asset classes did, right? So while the S&P declined 15% from September 2000 through December, September 2010, Here's what other things did. Bonds up 47%, large cap value 51%, small cap US 62, 
International Develop, 94. High Yield Bonds, 103. Real Estate, 109. EM, 234%. So how do you survive the last decade? You diversify thoughtfully. You approach investing with humility, right? Which is, it, what's the word? It doesn't mean it's always going to work, right? Like a year like this year, you could diversify with all those things and still everything is down. Of course, so but that's one mean, year. You can't talk course. to me about five months or right. a decade. Like if I want people works, to know just because it's not working this year doesn't mean that you don't still diversify. It doesn't mean that you don't still go into all these different sectors you're talking about. Because over the long term, which most people should be investing for, not a week or a month or a year, you know, these things will work out. This is why the concept has been involved around forever and won a lot of awards. Exactly. But I think people are surprised when I say those stats about the last decade, because ultimately, yes, that was a really, really bad decade, no matter what. But you felt much better after the end of that 10 year period if you didn't just hold large U.S. companies. And what happened in the preceding the, the, the decade thereafter, you <laughs> yeah. had 20 percent returns pretty much per year. You know, in know. the last 10 years. And the other crappy answer to how do you deal with bad markets over a 10 year period is usually be invested for the 10 years before that. Right. That's it. And look, if timing doesn't work out, if you're a new investor and you don't have the benefit of that, or you only started investing three years ago, then look, that probably means you have a lot of time ahead of you. So take advantage right now and buy, 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 buy. So I'm, I'm going to add on to what you're saying with my chart, because I think, you know, we talk about why is the market down so much? And we had several talk your charts earlier, uh, late last year, early this year, we talked about how gigantic some of these tech companies had been as a yeah. part of the market. Uh, for example, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and Tesla ended up accounting for 25% of the S&P 500 at the beginning of 2022. This is, so the chart I'm looking at is their weight. No, I'm sorry. This is performance. Performance. Yes. Yeah. So the, there are about eight companies pretty much all technology, all large companies, all of which we talked about last year to say, man, these are big. They're doing really, really well, but is there a risk that they could do really, do really poorly? And about half of the loss now of the S&P 500 this year is due to only eight technology companies. That makes sense. And you compare that to an S&P 500 that's equal weighted because the S&P is, is uh, market cap weighted and equal weighting where everyone gets the same weighting. Um, it's so only all down 500 about companies are the same proportion. That's what you're saying, equal right. weighted. Because in, in a market cap weighted, really the large, the small 100 or 200 companies end up being almost nothing. You know, there's 0.01% because it's really cap weighted to the bigger companies. Sure. But market weighted S&P is only down about 13%. So you're seeing yeah. about... This yeah. is also why it took to this year for most investors to feel the pain. Because everyone's been getting crushed that felt like investing was easy since probably October of last year, where the Pelotons and Zooms of the world have absolutely just been destroyed, right? right? There, there's a chance that those companies like don't recover or ultimately get acquired by Amazon <laughs> or something I mean, like that. How much, did you, how much have you heard, you know, again, this is a new environment we're in, right? This is a new investing world, just like we heard in 2000, where we had the tech stocks. This is it. These tech companies are going to be everything and, and anything. And you've got these high flyers. I will differentiate, though. Apple and an Amazon, right? Apple being up, whatever it is, that company prints money. And I sure. wouldn't compare an Apple to a Redfin or a Chewy or a DocuSign. No, but it goes back to the original premise of our probably first episode, which is if you liked Apple when it was at $50 a share, Apple is not a good buy at $150 a share or $200 a share. And again, it's not just buying the right companies. It's buying the right companies at the right price, which is why investing is so, so difficult. Yeah, um, eventually price matters. And price for the last three years, it didn't until it did. Right. And you never know when it's going to happen, but eventually price matters. And all this that's happening in public markets, for anyone out there that's, <laughs> that's in private markets or a founder of a company and trying to get funding and all that type of stuff, it's now hitting your valuations. And everyone that's an asset allocator in that private world, they're all sharpening their pencils. They're all saying, how much cash do you have? How long is that going to last? Because if you need to raise right now, I'll tell you, it's a down round. You're not getting your 100 times ARR annual recurring revenue that you were three months ago. 
Well, what do, what do investors and what do mutual fund um, managers look for? GARP. You know GARP? Uh, it's, it's the cousin of a carp. <laughs> it's growth at the right price. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> and so it's, you're looking for those companies where you say, I don't care exactly how much you're making now, but how much you're going to make going forward and what do I got to pay for that dollar of earnings? Yeah, the young unprofitable companies got absolutely smashed. Finally, the big companies that make up the indexes, right? Because like market cap indexes, those are undefeated over time. Why? Because the biggest, most successful companies eventually rise to the top. So ultimately, when everyone says they're index or non-active investment, cap weighting is an active decision, right? You're, de you're deciding you want to own the biggest companies at a bigger percentage than the smaller ones. What's helpful about that and why it also prepares you for the new world is because there's a turnover of about 50% in the top 10 names of the S&P 500 every 10 years. Right. So if Apple and Meta and Tesla, whatever, stop, stop being the best companies, it's okay. Eventually they will go away and you will own the best companies. Well, I think the other interesting statistic is that you know, over the last decade or more, growth companies have just crushed their value counterparts. Right, the growth are the high flyers, the values are your ugly companies. It doesn't mean that when you're buying a stock, you have to buy a great company at a great price. You can also buy an ugly company at a great price. And all that company has to do is beat expectations and it will go up. And so, so far this year, the Russell 1000 value index, this was as a couple of days ago, down 10%. The Russell 1000 growth index down 27%. That's now pain. that doesn't make up for the last decade where value got destroyed, but it's, it's getting there and hopefully it continues for a lot because we've got a a value bias in our firm. And we believe in companies that are beaten up, you know, should be bought more than those high flyers, especially in a world where interest rates are going up and that makes growth companies less attractive. The interest rate question is the biggest question from the growth side, because you could easily end up with a 10, 15 year period starting today where growth underperforms value. Right? Sure. And, it, and it wouldn't be surprising 10 to 15 years from now. Um, you said a word, capitulation. Has it happened yet? You think it gets worse before it gets better? I mean, if we read it from, from what our clients are saying, I haven't seen capitulation because normally the phones are ringing a little bit more than they are, at least for me. I haven't seen it. I don't know, I don't know about you, but I have not seen clients bailing out just yet. No, I haven't seen that. And I look, I think if we only look in our pond, it's probably a little bit biased because I think we have clients that are better behaved than your average investor. And that's because we lean into the educational part of this stuff. Um, and a lot know, a lot of a lot of clients stay in their lane, right? They they know that their highest and best use is what they do, and they delegate the rest to us, uh, and they trust our, our our advice. I think the recession trigger is going to be a bigger question. If you look at historically, if that can be a guide. Bear markets are worse if we get a, if they're coupled with a recession. They're less bad if they're not coupled with a recession. So you average thirty six percent drawdown over about nine months in an average recession. And then if you get a recession coupled, excuse me, a bear market coupled with the recession, it's on the higher end of the 36%. If it's a bear market with no recession, on the lower end of the 36%. So could well, we have more to go? Yeah. CBO just came out a report yesterday saying they don't expect it to be a recession. They expect positive growth for the next few quarters. We already had one negative quarter, right? So if you think we're already in a second negative quarter now, we are in a recession then right now. And it's also backwards looking. And that first negative GDP print was such a weird one because it was a negative GDP print because we're buying so much stuff because the consumer is, even though M2 money and everyone has less money because they've spent a ton of it, we're still buying. You saw Nordstrom. Nordstrom reported wonderful fit numbers compared to Target and Walmart. It probably speaks to their Marcos, higher end. It's, it's Target. I was told it was Target. It's not Target. Okay. You're right. I'm wrong. This is from Target. So I mean Target. Yeah. What else? Okay. We will see what how things pan out. I think the skies are are all already already are always cloudy. I think we know that for a fact. And as you said it correctly, even if they clear up with these incidents, there'll be other things in the future. We don't know if there's a start of a 40% decline, if we've already hit the bottom, but we know the recovery will come. Just a question of how long it takes. Yeah, how and when. The headlines will not be good. The market will bottom before the headlines do. Always keep that in mind. Okay. Brett, good to have you back. Yep. Talk to you later. See ya.